I call the Agriculture, Finance, and Policy Committee meeting to order on February 16, 2023. Uh, there is a quorum present. So uh, we are doing the minutes for February 9, 2023. Representative Jacob, may I have a motion? So moved. Uh, Representative Jacob moves to approve all the minutes for February 9, 2023. Any discussion? Hearing none, those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed say nay. The motion prevails and the minutes for February 9, 2023 are approved. Uh, next, we have the minutes for February 14th. Uh, Representative Hansen, may I have a motion to approve the minutes? So moved. Uh, Representative Hansen moves the approval of the minutes for February 14th, 2023. Any discussion? Hearing none, those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed say nay. The motion prevails and the minutes for February 14th, 2023 are approved. Uh, our first item on the agenda is a presentation from the Minnesota Department of Agriculture on grain indemnity. Um, Commissioner Peterson and Mark Abrahamson and Christine Mader, if you can make your way to the testifying table. Uh, thank you for being here today, Commissioner. Uh, please identify, identify yourself before the committee and proceed. Well, uh, Madam Chair, uh, members, uh, Tom Peterson, Commissioner of Minnesota Department of Agriculture, and I appreciate the uh, opportunity today to discuss this uh, issue or present our report on the indemnity fund. This was something that uh, was requested last year and, you know, an issue that we've been working on for many years uh, as the legislature. There's uh, a lot of different issues that have come up that you'll see in the report. And as you know, there's uh, bills uh, coming uh, today. Uh, the one, you know, the one thing I just, you know, want to, uh, you know, consider as we, you know, we look at this is looking at what our options are to address this issue because we've continued to have, uh, um, whether you want to call them failures or whatnot, you know, and I think when it gets down to me, it gets down to the farmer, uh, and I hope that at some point the committee can hear from some of the farmers that have lost uh, money as uh, because of this because what the farmers have asked me in my time before I was commissioner and uh, in my previous job and then now as commissioner is what are we going to do uh, 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 as a legislature to uh, help protect this and I think that's a really good point because you'll see that in some cases farmers get less than 10 cents on the dollar in this the other thing that stood out to me and and we could bring them in at some point too is our, our attorney general's office saying that Minnesota has one of the worst protections for farmers uh, in the upper Midwest. And so those are things that stand out to me. So what we did in this report too is look at some of the options to present the information to you uh, to consider. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Mark, <laughs> Mr. Abramson. Go ahead, please identify yourself before the committee. Thank you, Madam Chair. Mark Abramson, the Plant Protection Director at the Department of Agriculture. So I'm gonna give you a short presentation on our grain program and a grain indemnity fund. And then I also have Christine Mater here, grain program administrator uh, to help with questions as well. Okay, so uh, I was here a couple weeks ago and talked to the committee about plant protection and the grain program. So just to recap a little bit, uh, we license entities that buy grain or store grain. So we've got 579 licensed locations uh, across Minnesota. We've got six, uh, six staff, four inspectors, two people in the office, Christine and also Nick Milanowski, who was here with me last time. About $16 billion in grain purchased in 2022 licensing year, and that's protected by only $51 million in bonds. So that's the underlying issue is there really is not the, not the money there to protect uh, the amount of grain that's being moved. Um, so we have had a number of failures, as Tom referenced. So we have had uh, five that have been closed out uh, in the past uh, several years. So we've got a listing here. And the key uh, stat there is at the bottom, percent of total claims paid. As you can see, um, in general, the, when there is a failure and um, a loss, uh, the amount that can be recouped through the bonding process is relatively small. Um, that is summarized here in this pie chart. So out of about $7.5 million in losses in those five claims, we're only able to recapture about 800,000 through uh, the bond claim process. So a pretty small percentage. And um, you can see about half of those lost dollars were um, lost through voluntary extension to credit contracts, which are not covered at all under the bond claim process. So those are um, total losses. 
Uh, we have two um, failures that we're in the process of resolving bond claims, so Pipeline Foods uh, from 2021 and Global Processing 2022. Uh, we've got some projections of uh, the amount of the losses that the, the bonds held is going to cover, and as you can see, it's pretty small, 9%, 4.5%. And you can also see uh, Pipeline Foods going back to 2021. This can be a pretty lengthy process to try to resolve through the bond claim process. And so um, we have had uh, in other failures, Karlstad in particular, it took a while to work through all the, um, the legal proceedings. And we had uh, at least one producer who went bankrupt in the, the midst of waiting for uh, that bond claim payout. Um, an indemnity fund. So I'll talk a little bit about what that is. And this is not a new thing. An indemnity fund is in place for grain sales in 15 states and also uh, the province of Ontario and Canada. And uh, Christine and Nick, our, our grain team, have done a lot of work um, looking at these other states' programs, talking with staff from these other states about how their programs operate. And so we have uh, put together a framework that's based off of the experience of all these other states. And so uh, the way that a, an indemnity fund works is that it is a, a pot of money that's funded by a small fee on, the tran on, a, on a grain transaction. So when a producer sells grain to an elevator, there would be uh, a fee that's attached to that. So what we've proposed, and this is a standard amount in other states, is 0.2%, which would be $2 for every $1,000 of grain transacted. So the producer is paying that, that fee. Uh, the elevator is responsible for co collecting that money on every sale. And then annually, the elevator is making a payment into the grain indemnity fund. That money is then present. Uh, if there is a failure and a producer doesn't get paid, they can make a claim and get paid out of that indemnity fund. Uh, there is a few reasons why this is preferable to the current uh, bond claim process. Uh, first and foremost, the protections are going to be better for uh, farmers selling grain. Uh, clearly, uh, the main thing would be there would be more money available. So we have uh, targeted an uh, uh, indemnity fund that would be fully funded at $15 million. So that, as you imagine that, compared to a $150,000 bond, which is the maximum bond that a grain buyer holds, or a $500,000 bond, which is the maximum that a storage warehouse holds. So there's a lot more money that's available. Uh, the other thing that is common in other states where they have indemnity funds is voluntary extension credit contracts do get some coverage through that indemnity fund. So we've proposed um, kind of a tiered system where the longer uh, that, that credit is extended, the less opportunity there is to be paid out of the, the fund. But there is um, an opportunity for uh, those losses to be covered, which uh, as of now in our current system, they're not covered at all. And as I mentioned earlier, it's about half of the losses that we've seen. Um, this also gives us an opportunity for much faster payouts. So as I uh, you know, showed in that slide, pipeline, that failure is back from 2021. We're still um, trying to work through all the legal issues associated with that. So it, it takes quite a long time for producers to see a payout from the bond claim process. With an indemnity fund, we can, mail, we can evaluate a claim and make that payout immediately and then work to resolve whatever legal issues need to be resolved with the uh, the entity that, that uh, had the financial insolvency, and they may have some responsibility to pay back into the fund, but that's not on the producer to be waiting for that money to come through. We can, we can make payment uh, as soon as we've evaluated the claim. Uh, and opt-out is a common part of other programs, so allowing those who choose not to participate to opt-out and, and not participate. That would be um, a little bit cumbersome, perhaps, because that farmer would still be required to pay into the fund, but then... Uh, or pay an elevator, you know, part of that fee on the, the transaction, but then get paid back by the elevator in uh, the form of a refund or by the program. So um, that is uh, something that's commonly offered in other states, but it is, to our understanding, not um, commonly utilized. So it's, it's kind of a handful of farmers in the other states that are opting out, uh, but it's something that, that we recognize would be an important thing to include. And then also uh, potentially a reduced cost to industry. So currently elevators are required to hold bonds. That comes at a cost uh, to the industry. Our estimate, estimate is that cost is somewhere between $500,000 to $2.5 million a year that is uh, paid in uh, cost to maintain those bonds. Um, with an indemnity fund, bonding would largely not be needed. Uh, we would still have some requirements for new entities to hold a bond um, or perhaps entities that have had some kind of financial difficulty. Um, but uh, most businesses who are financially in good shape would not be required to hold, hold a bond. Um, okay, Tom mentioned the report. So in the, the last session, uh, the legislature requested that we uh, put together a report on the grain program. 
We've had a, a grant advisory group since 2018 that we consult with. And so for this um, specific report, we formalized it a little bit more um, and added some representatives, uh, some farmer representatives and some representatives from elevators. Uh, that report was just submitted uh, this week. And we got some good, uh, good information from the group. Um, there's kind of three main um, points that we want to focus on from the report. Uh, number one, the question of the indemnity fund. We didn't reach um, a consensus as a group that an indemnity fund is the right way to go. Um, I think there are things that, that can be done and tweaks that can be made that would make it more palatable to more people, um, but we didn't have a, a universal consensus that this is the right approach to take. Uh, financial reporting. The last time that the Green Program uh, had legislation passed, um, we had the, the financial reporting requirements tightened up um, for elevators. And what we've heard uh, very loud and clear is this has really created a burden, uh, particularly for small to medium-sized elevators um, and costs that they, they haven't previously had to, to bear. So we, we heard uh, pretty loud and clear that that has, that has been a burden. Uh, and there's a desire to perhaps for some entities to loosen those financial reporting requirements and also a desire uh, for the department to try to uh, establish more financial oversight and perhaps metrics that um, should be established for uh, entities to, to meet um, through their, their financial statements. Uh, we also talked a lot about the current bond system and really how that is not, um, I think as I tried to emphasize, not really uh, serving the purpose for which it's intended. Um, the bonds are too small relative to the, the losses that we're seeing occur when an elevator uh, goes out of business. And also, they may be too small to be serving as a screening mechanism. So one of the, the key aspects of a bond is supposed to be that the bonding company is evaluating the financial um, uh, standing of that company and then issuing a bond after you know, determining that they're in good standing. I think what we're seeing is that the bonds are not high enough for uh, the bonding companies to really uh, be feel like they need to do uh, an in-depth review of those companies. And so it, it doesn't really seem that any companies are getting screened out, even though we have had companies um, that are failing. Um, and then finally, uh, also a desire for the department to try to put some more uh, work into education around this issue for producers and the, the um, uh, some of the things to watch out for in terms of a grain, uh, grain transaction. So. Um, those are the things that we have um, uh, taken for ourselves out of that report. And um, that is the end of our presentation. So we would be happy to answer questions. Thank you. Uh, Representative Nelson. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Chair. And, and uh, just, you, I think they kind of covered it a little bit. You know, you've got $16 billion of grain purchased in 2022 and $51 million in bonds. And, uh, you know, the... There's a, there's a big discrepancy there on the number, and uh, you know, grain often comes and go. You know, the, doesn't mean there's an elevator sitting on that much, but it comes and goes. And I'm just, uh, you know, looking at the the payout uh, percentage of you know bonded. You know, the, sometimes it's uh, you know as low as five percent. Uh, others was you know up to thirty six percent. It looks like in the Carlstead elevator. And just wondering, uh, in an indemnity fund, will it? Will a seller be made whole, or what? What percentage of, you know, will will they be able to recapture, or kind of where the, where is that? Uh, Christine, uh, my name is Christine Mater. I'm the program administrator for the Green and Warehousing Unit um, representative. It would uh, be determined in a bill. It could be up to 100 percent. It could be a percentage. Uh, many other states have bills written where uh, maybe 65 percent of voluntary extension of credits are con are covered, um, and 100 of cash sales are covered. So, uh, it could it it could be a different um, percentages. The bill that was proposed um, last year uh, was had a metric 70 percent covered, then 50 percent covered, then 25 percent covered based on when the grain was delivered and how long it had been in the elevator. Representative Nelson. Okay, uh, and thank you for that. And um, so I think that's really probably up to us to decide uh, where that where that goes. So thank you for that answer. And and I think uh, one of the other questions I have uh, is the under the financial reporting. Um, right now, uh, you kind of touched on it. You know, the small grain buyers are are being affected by the either having required to review or an audit, um, depending on how they they purchase their grain. And would the, as I understand it, the indemnity would maybe remove that uh, 
requirement, or how does that change or affect that? Christine? Uh, Representative, no, at this point, an indemnity fund, uh, that language does not change the financial requirement. That would take a, another change. Representative Nelson? No, thank you. Uh, Representative Hansen. Thank you, Madam Chair. It, you know, this is kind of, if, if we were hearing this in other committees, there would be kind of jaws on the floor of, of the request. Um, you know, we're talking about private businesses and asking the state, the general taxpayers, to pick up the cost literally for private sector waste, fraud, and abuse. Literally. Where it seems that the bonding, which was last changed in 2004, could be updated. We could change those requirements so there'd be the fiscal responsibility to cover <clears throat> those costs. But it's, it's kind of uh, jaw-dropping to see a request that the taxpayer should pay this cost. I, I, we don't do this for anybody else. And these are businesses. We've heard, I mean, I could see maybe if this was a public entity and we had to pick up a cost, if we had a public grain buying system, but these are private sector entities. And that's a lot of money. That's a lot of money that could go for a lot of things. Um, if the grain paid a percentage, which was the original proposal, but we've heard nobody wants to do that. I've read the, through the letters. They don't want to pay anything in. Don't want to do the auditing. Don't want to have even the financial stuff that's there now, which we've had testimony previously. It's too hard. Just come to the taxpayers for $15 million. I, it's, it's stunning. Commissioner? Madam Chair and, uh, and uh, uh, Representative Hansen, you know, I think this, I appreciate the discussion, you know, and I think that we've heard and visited uh, with, our, with our farmers for many years. This has been on the books and, you know, I always, uh, you know, we could use it or not use it however we do that we say agriculture is different and we do different things. But, you know, this is something that we've heard is incredibly important. I go to the farmer. I always think about the farmer and the farmers that I've worked with that have been through this. And uh, we need every farmer we can in the state. You know, we, we, you know, we lose about 500 farmers a year. And uh, as, uh, as Mr. Abramson said, as they go through bankruptcy uh, and <clears throat> pieces that have been brought upon this and the failures of the different elevators have been for uh, different reasons that, you know, are, are heartbreaking. And so we look at the options and uh, this is an option that we've looked at and talked with people and, and we think it is a good investment and it's unfortunate. You know, we've looked at raising the... Uh, um, uh, we've looked at raising the bond limits. You know, this, this bill has been around. Representative Swadzinski had it many, many years ago after his uh, Porter elevator, and we talked about what would we do, raise, if we doubled the uh, uh, bonding, you know, to people would get, what, 4%, 8% or 10%. That's still probably going to put some farmers in bankruptcy or put them in a tough spot. So as we look at it and we look at this uh, this piece and, to make it palatable or to put it forward, whatever you want to say is the best thing with the surplus with money that we have uh, would help jumpstart it. And there would be a cost on the producers uh, and those farmers would be paying that. Uh, and we've seen it work in other states. I just came back from Washington and I spent time with the other commissioners and secretaries and directors that have a, a indemnity account. And they say that it's very important and it's a concern in a volatile uh, grain market. And so, I, I get what you're saying. I understand it. But, you know, at the end of the day, you know, uh, the, the farmers and the protection, I think, is uh, incredibly important. Representative Hansen. Thank you, Madam Chair. And, and I appreciate that. You know, I actively engage in farming, but I also look around my district and I see businesses close that have been multi-generation. They don't get any help. I mean, all of us in all of our districts have that. And sometimes it's, things happen. I understand that. I understand people getting sick. I understand uh, things falling apart. But I also understand we've got boards of directors and responsibility and accountability and fiduciary responsibility. And um, 
it's just things are things are different now. I mean, we all have we all have those responsibilities, and you're asking all of us, all of our constituents, to pay for. It. So I think they'll want some. How, do, how what is the equitable solution here to keep things up? Because I I don't want only have three grain buyers out there either. I mean, we can't have that consolidation. We have to have diversity of, of size and location and options that are out there. But I, I just, it's always go to, go to the cash when they're, and I know you've been working on it for years. I know this has been there for years, but I look at these letters and there's an expectation or entitlement that the taxpayer will just pick it up. And I just, there's a lot of other things that we could have pick up. There's a lot of other things that we could invest in. And I think that's our task here, is it's just not the same as it was. So. Representative Anderson. Thank you, Madam Chair. Just a comment to Representative Hanson. I'm looking at this list here. North Country Seeds, Porter, Ashby, Carlstad, Buckwheat, Pipeline, and Global. And I think I'd be safe in saying not one of these was the fault of the farmers. It's uh, whatever, uh, hedging, uh, mismanagement, whatever, but uh, let's not come down too hard on the farmer in this instance because um, they are not the cause of these, in my opinion, the cause of whatever is happening to our elevators. And you know, I think there are plenty of examples in this state, especially with a $17 billion surplus of our state reaching out and helping people. A lot of people are asking for help. And this is an example, I think, where where the money would be would be well put. Question for testifiers, and I want to talk for a second about the larger elevators that do the full-blown audit, expensive audit. Now, what happens when they complete that audit? What do they do with it? Director Mark or Christine? Representative, uh, it needs to be submitted to us for review, so they're required to submit that audit. I look through it to determine that it meets statutory requirements, and then I file it. So the statutory requirements are um, as basic as a balance sheet, a profit and loss statement, a cash flow statement, a retained earnings statement, their gross annual grain purchases, um, as well as a CEO certificate. Representative Anderson. And does that material in that audit become public? knowledge is it available to the public representative no it, it is non-public data thank you uh, representative Nelson uh, thank you uh, madam chair and I think uh, a little bit uh, representative Anderson kind of uh, covered the question but I'm wondering you know of these elevators that are listed here the grain buyers um, what is the reason for their failure if I mean, maybe you can't disclose specifics but uh, if you could maybe a little bit of high level. What is the, the reasoning behind that? Uh, Representative, we've seen uh, lots of reasons for failure. Um, we've seen general managers uh, get sick and uh, you know those that are working at the elevator have to pick up the pieces and, and not be able to do that. Um, you know, we've seen companies come in and buy, you know, buy up companies and, and unfortunately go, go bankrupt soon after. I don't know if there's, um, one or two reasons, there's a multitude of reasons why we're seeing failures. Representative Nelson. Okay. And yeah, I, th I think that's, uh, you know, thank you for that. It's not, you know, like Re Representative Anderson said, it's not been the, generally not been on the, the result of something the farmers have done. You know, many of them have maybe forward contracted grain, you know, trying to be responsible stewards themselves and, uh, you know, satisfying the expectations of maybe their lenders or you know good business practices and you know through no fault of their own other than they unfortunately picked the wrong grain buyer um, or at an unfortunate time are are out and and I think that uh, having a I think that we've got kind of two options we can either require uh, raise the bonding requirements or uh, in, um, go to a indemnity and I you know, there's there's pros and cons to each system, but I, you know, this is something that's been worked on for quite a while, and I, um, you know, hearing Commissioner Peterson's uh, words of, you know, we can't continue to lose the farmers because the the more farmers we lose, 
that does affect everybody in the state. Um, that does affect all of us statewide. So there is a there is an effect on everybody in the state, uh, whether directly or indirectly, on this. So thank you. Representative Purcell. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I am wondering how other states have set up these indemnity funds. Um, I similarly uh, have concerns about um, where the where the pinch comes to. I don't want that pinch on the grower who has done everything and has put out the money. Um, so are there other examples of how these were initially set up or continued to be funded? On that map, we saw so many. Um, I imagine there has to be some kind of variety. If you could elaborate, thank you. Director Mark or Christine? Um, so many of the, or, sorry, Representative, um, many of the uh, people um, that we reached out to at other states and many of the other programs that we looked at were funded on first purchase, first grain purchases. They were funded by um, the, the growers themselves. Excellent, Purcell. Okay. Uh, I do have a question. Uh, Director Mark, you, you mentioned that uh, there was not a group consensus on the indemnity fund. Uh, why is that? And if were there are there solutions being discussed too as well? Yeah, thanks, Madam Chair. Um, yeah, I, I guess I, I, I can't speak for any other group as to why they would oppose an indemnity fund, but like we, we clearly did not have a consensus that that was the path <laughs> forward. Um, I think kind of as had been brought up here, the alternative would be a higher bond, higher bonding levels. Um, you know, I think in our view, the problem there is, yes, that's a little bit more protection, but again, it's, it's a relatively small protection considering the, the value of the grain that's being moved and um, also, all the other issues we see at bonding, the slow payouts, um, delays with legal actions, uh, that would continue. Okay. Uh, Representative Anderson? <clears throat> yeah, Representative Anderson. In here. Thank you. Uh, just, a, just a comment, Madam Chair. Thank you. Um, this has been a, you know, really a, a hot-button topic among farmers, uh, you know, for, for a while. And one of the funding mechanisms has been to raise the bond that uh, the elevators pay into to, to fund this. And then the realization kind of hit that raising the bond, increasing their cost, is just a cost of business. They're gonna pass on to the farmer anyway. So if, if an elevator is spending $10,000 on a bond today and we raise that to 50,000 tomorrow, it's just a cost of business. They're going to pass on to the farmer. So one way or the other, uh, under some of these circumstances, the farmer is going to wind up paying, paying the bill for it. That is noted. Thank you, Representative Anderson. Uh, Representative Purcell. Sorry, I have a follow-up question. Um, in these materials, I thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I am wondering uh, how we can see who sits on the Grain Advisory Group and if they um, have any particular affiliations that might be helpful information. Christine? Uh, Representative, I do think that information is included in the report. So it might be in the, uh, in the, uh, in the body. Yes, and they also provided <laughs> letters at the end of the report. Right, Representative Purcell? They don't have a copy. Thank you. I, I see the letters, but I didn't see a list of the members. Is each letter representative okay. of one member? I apologize. We can get that to you. Okay, thank you. All right, thank you. Uh, any further discussion? All right. Commissioner, closing remarks. Yep. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, members. And just to reiterate, this, like I said, has just been a tough issue, you know, and I just, uh, you know, there was a farmer, I wasn't here yesterday, but I know he was here yesterday, or a couple of them that, you know, lost money in two different um, things, you know, and just, like, very tough uh, situation. So we get back and we look at, you know, what are the options? Do we want to help those people? Do we not want to help those people? Um, you know, this is what, you know, we've come down to and why we went down this path. I'm open to suggestions, open to ideas on, you know, this whole thing. Uh, this is the road we went down. We heard more support for an indemnity account. That's why we went that direction. Uh, you know, there's other things that have been put forward to as well. So I just want to say, you know, to all the legislators that were, and to our stakeholders that we're willing to work on this with the elevators, with everybody that's impacted, you know, and the other issues with the smaller and medium size and the uh, reporting, you know, I think it's, it's very important, but ultimately, 
you know, we want to, you know, my goal is to help the farmers too as well. So thank you for hearing this and hope, look forward to further uh, discussions. Thank you, Commissioner, and thank you to Mark and Christine for being here for your testimony and presentation. Uh, I do know that this is an important issue and we will continue to have um, hearings on this issue moving forward uh, in future committee hearings. Uh, next uh, item on the agenda is House File 475, Representative Hansen on file incentive payment recipients. Piece, uh, to your bill, Representative Hansen. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'd move House File 475 be laid over for possible inclusion in the omnibus bill. Members, House File 475 is similar to the bill that was introduced the last few years. It provides for transparency and accountability when the state is providing millions of dollars uh, for incentive payments. Uh, these requirements are similar to what other agencies require, uh, particularly in deed for granting. So it, uh, if I can walk through those, it provides uh, the commissioner who uh, would get the producer's business structure, name and address of the producer's parent company, cumulative list of all financial assistance received from grantors for the project, goals for a number of jobs created and progress in achieving these goals. That is something that deed requires for uh, grants. Equity hiring goals and progress in achieving those goals wage goals and progress in achieving those goals. Board member and executive compensation. Is the money going to executive compensation, board member compensation? Evidence of compliance with environmental permits. Producers intended an actual use of permits received by the commissioner. And then if applicable, the last financial audit opinion statement. So that's not the audit, but the opinion statement uh, from a certified public accountant uh, on the business. And that, uh, there's a fiscal note in it um, and description of that that you have in your packet, uh, three pages of that, I would ask for your support. All right, I see that we have uh, an amendment. Uh, we have the A1 amendment. Who is offering that amendment? Representative Harder, to your amendment. Thank you, Chair Bain. Uh, I will also request a roll call vote on this, please. Roll call being requested, and can you please move your amendment? Yes, I move the amendment, uh, the A1. Uh, Representative Hansen. Okay, so my amendment uh, addresses the line number three where it states, a cumulative list of all financial assistance received from all grantors for uh, the project. And my amendment uh, is to eliminate this particular line. So the bill, this puts the Department of Agriculture in a position of requiring a program participants that their data has remained private, but it also puts the program participants in the position of potentially being forced to divulge trade secrets as a condition of participating in the program. So the effect of the requirement uh, to report all financial assistance from all grantors um, bill would mean a grant recipient would need to report financial assistance from private sources or even disclose details of a private loan transaction. So removing this um, line would be important uh, for people's information. I see this as um, more red tape and um, obstacles for people to overcome. If it is an individual's information, um, years of working in banking. If that stuff is made private in any way, shape, or form, there's always the potential uh, that their information could be made public and they could use lose their identity um, and that is very expensive to, uh, to get back. And so I request members to please accept and vote yes for this amendment. Thank you. Representative Hansen. Thank you, Madam Chair. I would oppose the amendment, but Representative Harder, I would work with you on lines 1.15 to make sure that that is all public grantors, so that is any public assistance that is being received uh, uh, would be provided. That's similar to what deed requires. I think in the recent uh, COVID aid, you had to list what any aid that you had received from public entities, whether it was federal or private, or pu federal or public. So that would be, that's my intent, but I am willing, this bill is being laid over to clarify that it is the public grantors, not the private. So I'd ask at this time to um, oppose the A1 amendment. Any further discussion? 
Representative Harder. Okay, thank you, Chair Bang. So when you say that you want to work on that, how would you, would you change the wording? What would you be working uh, with me on that? Representative Hansen. Madam Chair, I would put on lines 1.15 between the word all and grantors, put the word public in there. Um, Representative Harder. So that it's public entities, not private <coughs> loans. Representative Harder. Thank you, Chair Bang. Then is it possible to amend and have an oral what do you call that? An oral agreement or an oral amendment? Uh, Representative Hansen, what do you? I actually think it, it's a little more complicated, Madam Chair. I think it's a little more complicated on that. That's why I would ask, okay. or if you wanted to withdraw the amendment, um, because your amendment is deleting lines 1.15. To put the word public in would be to be amending line 1.15. It's a little more complicated than I think what has normally been done as an oral amendment. Uh, but I, I give you my word that I would be, that's what I'm intending. And this bill is being laid over to come back later. So. Yeah. I would agree that an oral amendment is, if we were to do an oral amendment, it would be a little bit more complicated. To make, and just to make sure you do it correctly, we'll just vote on the amendment as is, if that's. Representative Anderson? Madam Chair, if she withdrew her amendment, it would be pretty simple to add one word to line 1.15, I would suggest that would be a possibility uh, to make it less complicated. Representative Harder, are you withdrawing your amendment? So the answer would be yes. Thank you, well, Chair Bank. Well, better get your assurance. <laughs> <laughs> I'm nodding, I'm nodding, uh, Madam Chair. <laughs> I mean, I think that works. Okay. Just we couldn't amend the, yeah. the amendment. So if you withdraw the amendment, then if you want to make an oral amendment, I would accept that oral amendment. If Mr. Sullivan sees that as correct. Is that correct? Okay, so then I will withdraw. Okay. Okay. Sounds good. And then Representative Hanson, what will be the oral amendment? Or, or uh, Representative Harder, would you do the oral amendment? Yes, I'll make the oral okay. amendment to uh, change uh, 1.15 to add which word? Public. 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 Mr. Sullivan. If you could repeat. Reps, uh, Mr. Sullivan. And Madam Chair and members, the oral amendment to House File 475 is on page 1, line 15. After the second instance of all, insert the word public. So the, this, as amended, the line will read, a cumulative list of all financial assistance received from all public grantors for the project. Representative Hansen. Representative Harder. Does that I would support that amendment. <coughs> Representative Harder. Thank you. Yes. All right. Uh, would you still like a roll call? I think it's going to be late. I don't think we need a roll call. Okay. All right. All right. So then, uh, Chair Bang. Reps and Harder? So since I, I withdrew that and we're changing that, then I don't need a, a roll call. Okay. Sounds good. Thank you. Uh, any other discussion? <coughs> All right, so we're going to vote on the oral amendment that uh, Mr. Sullivan has just described. All those in favor of the motion say aye. 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 Opposed say nay. The ayes have it, and the amendment, the oral amendment is uh, adopted. The next amendment that we have is the A2. Uh, who will be offering that amendment? Representative Jacobson. Uh, Representative Jacob. Mm -hmm. Uh, thank you, Chair Bang. So I'll move the A2 amendment to House File 475, and I'll request a roll call on this amendment as well. This amendment simply uh, would simply eliminate the new requirement that producers submit a financial audit opinion statement to the Department of Agriculture. The reason for the amendment is because the financial audit requirement is very onerous at 125 pages. It's very expensive, costing $4,125 per audit. I think uh, last time around there were 13 audits at e equating to more than $53,000. So this requirement is really quite likely driving business out of our state, and I think we've seen a couple of examples of that. Um, like I said, just overly uh, onerous. So um, I think this amendment would make this a better bill, and I certainly would urge everyone to support it. Representative Hansen. 
Uh, Madam Chair, I'd oppose the A2 amendment. I think if we're providing millions of dollars, we need to know what the status is of the, of the entity. So, and it's the opinion statement, not the full audit that would be coming in. All right. Uh, Representative Purcell? Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm not sure if the question is for the bill author or for the uh, amendment author. Um, I'm wondering about the first two words on line 2.5, if applicable. Maybe this is to Mr. Sullivan. Um, I feel like that might help me better understand what we're talking about, the if applicable lines. Can you restate your question again? Um, I guess, uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I'm not sure what the if applicable means. At the nonprofit where I worked, we only had to get an audit by a CPA if we um, had over a certain dollar amount of, um, of business in the course of a year. So I'm not sure the if applicable, if what that applies to, if that's um, the revenue at a farm, if that's a size. I'm interested to know when it might be applicable. Representative Hansen. Thank you, Madam Chair, and, and Mr. Sullivan can help me out here. But this, these funds go to uh, uh, biofuel producers, and so the if applicable is similar to what you're saying. If they are required to have the audit, then they provide the latest audit uh, that they have received. So it's not even an annual, it's the latest audit. And some of them may be on a different audit requirement depending on their volume of, of business. But I would go to Mr. Sullivan uh, uh, from the drafting side of it. Mr. Sullivan? Madam Chair and members, um, the statutes for the bio-incentive program do not require um, producers to have financial <laughs> audits. So I think in this context, if applicable means if the producer, for another reason, maybe they're a publicly traded company or their lender requires an audit, if they already have an audit, they would need to submit a copy of the finance, excuse me, the opinion statement to the department. But if they didn't have an audit, I don't think this language would require them to get one. Representative Purcell? Um, I believe that clarifies it for me. I feel like perhaps the language could be a little clearer, but I'm not an expert in this area. Thank you. Representative Anderson? Thank you, Madam Chair. I wonder if Mr. Sullivan could uh, explain to us the difference between the audit and the opinion statement. We just heard the Department of Ag say that uh, the audits themselves were private and not public uh, to be disclosed. Uh, what about the opinion statement, Mr. Sullivan? Mr. Sullivan? Um, Madam Chair and, and Representative Anderson, um, I'm not an expert in, in financial accounting and audits, but it, I think what this means is the, the, the opinion statement is the auditor's statement of whether the uh, financial statements are uh, materially accurate, whether they accurately reflect the current uh, business situation of the audited entity. So I think it's, it's not the financial statements necessarily, it's the cover letter that okay. says we've reviewed the financial statements in this company's books and we believe that their financial statements are accurately presented. Representative Anderson. Okay, thank you for that. And um, that's kind of what I suspected and really that's kind of fluff in a way that it doesn't really say much of anything except that the audit, audit was done and the standards were, were uh, upheld. So to me, maybe this is a, a lot of uh, discussion about something that in some cases wouldn't be ap applicable and the opinion statement is simply an auditor statement saying that, yeah, they did the audit and uh, things appear to be in order, but nothing uh, concrete would be released under that scenario. So thank you. Any further discussion? Representative Jacob? Uh, the if applicable, I think last time around, it, it was applicable 13 times. So, uh, and again, that equated to $53,625 of additional burdensome red tape and uh, really unnecessary expense. So, um, again, I just I just re knew the argument that this is uh, it's very onerous and it's you know, it's been proven that we've got businesses that are. Um, they were going to establish in our in our state. There's a NPR article on this. Um, due to the due to the delays that jeopardize our ability to meet the product and demand dead, deadlines, 
will pursue development of our sixth mill in another state. So, I mean, these types of regulations are driving business away, and I'm just trying to improve the bill to keep as many businesses in Minnesota as we can. So, thank you. Okay. Representative Anderson? Just one more comment, Madam Chair. Yeah, I agree with uh, my colleague that, um, you know, we, we've lost a soybean crushing plant to North Dakota. We just had OSB decide to not build in Minnesota. And if a business contemplating uh, coming here or applying for some of these aid things that we have, to me it just sends the wrong message that, um, and I don't think that's a message we should be sending right now. So uh, I would support the amendment by Representative. All right. uh, Representative Samara. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, thank you, Representative Hansen, for bringing this bill. You know, I, I sit on the Workforce Committee as well. I don't know if there's anyone else who um, is also on that committee, but, um, you know, these are pretty, you know, for the um, nonprofits that we look at on that committee who get um, funding and from support from DEED, these are pretty standard questions that we ask um, organizations to give us, organizations that have, you know, limited resources. Um, so I would say that I don't, I don't see this as overreaching. I see this as just the accountability that I think I hear a lot of colleagues asking for. Um, and so I don't know why this would be any different. Thank you. All right, any further discussion? All right, we will vote on the A2 amendment. Uh, Matthew Seltzer. Chair Bang. No. Representative Purcell. No. Uh, Representative Anderson. Anderson, aye. Representative Cha. Excuse. Representative Frederick. No. Representative Hansen. No. Representative Reem. No. Representative Censor Murrah. No. Representative Tabke. No. Representative Perkel. Aye. Representative Harder. Aye. Representative Jacob. And Jacob, aye. Representative Nelson. Aye. There being five ayes and seven nays, the motion uh, for the A2 amendment is not adopted. All right, seeing no further amendments, uh, do we have any testifiers to the bill as amended? Closing remarks, Representative Hansen. Thank you, Madam Chair. I, I think uh, as Representative Censor Mira said, these are fairly standard things that are being applied elsewhere uh, for grants. I think they are needed. I think they are needed very much on some of the dollars we send out uh, in this committee and so particularly very large grants. Uh, so uh, I ask for your support. I know it's being laid over. Uh, happy to work with people if they have concerns. All right. House file 475 is laid over as amended. Next we have is House file 1474, Frederick, on the biofuel financial assistance funding provided and money appropriated uh, to your bill, Representative Frederick, if you can please move your bill. Thank you, Madam Chair. I move that uh, House File 1474 uh, be laid over for possible inclusion for in an omnibus bill. Please tell us about your bill. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. House File 1474 is looking to expand consumer access to biofuels. Uh, this is consistent with what the legislature has done in previous bienniums. Um, expanding biofuel usage has been a, a priority of President Biden. It's been a priority of Governor Walls uh, and has also been a priority in years past of the legislature. Uh, and so this would be setting money aside uh, to be able for different gas stations to be able to apply for grant money so they can upgrade their infrastructure so they are continue to be able to offer or, or more can offer uh, uh, fuel with higher levels of biofuel in it. Um, in the bill, uh, current the appropriation, and there's just the, the dot, dot, dots. Um, the governor has uh, indicated that he would like a $1.5 million increase uh, in that fund. 
uh, and I had an amendment drafted to fill in those dots, uh, but apparently, and I think fiscal staff could explain it better than I could, uh, that uh, it's not 1.5 million that I needed to add as an amendment. Um, so I don't know if, uh, Madam Chair, if the fiscal staff would like to explain that. But my intention is to put um, uh, 4.5 million, and I think the fiscal staff can explain why. Okay, Mr. Savory. Chair and members, the appropriation um, being discussed currently is within the um, Agri program, and the Agri program has several carve outs or specifically riders that appropriate specific amounts of dollars for specific purposes. Um, the infrastructure in question here, um, the base for that, which is tracked by both the House and Senate, is $3 million. I cannot speak for the Department of the Governor, but it feels like the intent here is to go from $3 million to $4.5 million with the Governor's change item in his budget. And I believe Representative Frederick's, um, your intent would be to go $1.5 million higher above the base, and that would be $4.5 million um, for the new new program, or for the new uh, appropriation. Representative Frederick? Uh, that, so... Yes, that my intention is to raise it uh, $1.5 million more, which is why it's a $4.5 million total increase because the, back in 2021, the legislature uh, included the $3 million already. So if everyone follows the math there, um, that is my intention to be able to um, help continue to expand uh, access to biofuels across Minnesota. All right. Uh, discussion to the bell. Or I see we have testifiers, actually. We'll hear from testifiers first, and then we'll have discussion. Uh, Brian Werner, Executive Director from Minnesota Biofuels Association, if you can proceed and uh, identify yourself before the committee. Chair Vang and, and members of the Agriculture Finance and Policy Committee. My name is Brian Werner, and I serve as the Executive Director of the Minnesota Biofuels Association a nonprofit organization dedicated to supporting and representing the renewable fuel industry in Minnesota. On behalf of the association and its eight ethanol production plants, I appreciate the opportunity to provide testimony in support of House File 1474. We want to especially thank Representative Frederick and all the bipartisan co-sponsors for their leadership on the bill. Last year, Minnesota, Minnesota's biofuels industry produced 1.34 billion gallons of ethanol, which according to the University of Minnesota Extension, helped to generate 8 billion of economic activity through sales, including 1.9 billion in direct income for Minnesota residents. The industry supports nearly 26,000 jobs across the state. Higher blends of ethanol drive commodity demand for farmers, lower consumer energy costs at the pump, provide economic development in greater Minnesota, and improve air quality through decreased greenhouse gas emissions. In 2022, for the first time ever, Minnesota sold more than 100 million gallons of E15, which is a blend of gasoline with 15% ethanol that is commonly marketed as unleaded 88 at the pump. These record sales demonstrate that when consumers go to the pump, they want a cheaper, more environmentally friendly option. E15 provides that option because ethanol cuts carbon emissions by 50% compared to gasoline and is anywhere between five and 40 cents cheaper per gallon. In fact, the Minnesota Department of Commerce estimated that E15 was priced 25 cents per gallon lower than regular gasoline on average from June to August of 2022, which equated to $7 million in consumer savings in just those three months. These savings reach more consumers thanks to the biofuel infrastructure program, which has provided grant funding to fueling stations for the installation of blender pumps and underground storage tanks that can accommodate E15, as well as higher blends. Uh, the Minnesota Biofuels Association strongly supports House File 1474 and all other biofuel infrastructure investment proposals because they will help us reach statewide E15 retail compatibility and lead to immediate and affordable emissions reductions via the use of low carbon ethanol in our transportation fuel supply. Thank you again for the opportunity to testify. And we look forward to working with you to continue supporting the agricultural economy, diversifying our fuels, driving down gas prices, and strengthening our national energy security. Thank you, Director Bryan. Uh, next testifier is Richard uh, Swiverson, president of the Minnesota Corn Girls Association. Can you hear me, uh, Chair Vang? Yes, we can. Thank you, Chair Vang and mem members of the committee. My name is Richard Severson. 
I currently serve as the president of the Minnesota Corn Growers Association. I farm together with my son and my wife in Clontarf, Minnesota. We raise corn, soybeans, hay, and we have a small family sheep operation. On behalf of Minnesota Corn Growers, nearly 7,000 family farm members, I want to thank Representative Frederick and his bipartisan co-authors for bringing HF 1474 forward. A key priority for the Minnesota corn growers is to expand access and use of higher ethanol blends like on Leaded 88, which is a fuel blend containing 15% ethanol. It helps improve air quality and reduce carbon emissions while giving drivers a higher octane fuel at a lower price. The corn raised on family farms like mine produces ethanol from the starch component of the kernel, but also a high value protein rich distillers dried grain as a source of livestock feed and corn oil often used as a feedstock for the production of biodiesel. Co-product utilization at Minnesota's 19 ethanol plants has resulted in greater efficiency and as a result, today's corn ethanol reduces greenhouse gas emissions by 46% on average compared to gasoline. Not only does blending ethanol with gasoline result in lower carbon emissions, but also causes reductions in particulate matter, carbon monoxide, and nitrogen oxides, which can create smog. The carbon emission reduction profile of today's corn ethanol has been verified by the U.S. Department of Energy and Agriculture, the California Air Resources Board, and academic institutions ranging from the University of Illinois to Harvard, MIT, and University of California at Davis. Ethanol was first blended in our fuel supply to help fight air pollution and smog and a key reason why Minnesota started using ethanol blends in the metropolitan area in 1992. Ethanol is a key ingredient in our fuel supply that not only acts as an octane booster, but also displaces harmful aromatic hydrocarbons. In 2021, the Hormel Institute released a study focused on the reduction of these harmful aromatics and the potential cancer risks that they cause. Research on the hazards posed by these aromatic compounds is ongoing. One of the key challenges in moving to a 15% blend of ethanol statewide is the sometimes costly upgrade required at retail locations. MCGA supports finding a long-term, ongoing funding source to assist retailers with upgrades and replacements of infrastructure needed to offer higher blends of biofuels statewide. HF 1474 is a step in the right direction to begin expanding access to higher blends of ethanol in Minnesota. The ethanol industry is not only crucial to corn farmers' economic vitality, but higher blends of ethanol and fuel provides multiple benefits statewide to Minnesota consumers, communities, and the economy. Unleaded 88 and other mid-level blends provide cheaper fuel options while also providing higher octane and increased air quality without sacrificing vehicle efficiency. Thank you, Chair Vang, for the opportunity to testify, particularly for affording me the opportunity to testify remotely on House File 1474. And we look forward to continue working with you, Representative Frederick, and the rest of your committee on ways we can expand biofuel use in Minnesota. Thank you, President Richard. Uh, now to the discussion to the bill. Oh, do we have any further testifiers? Okay, so you no know further testifiers, discussion to the bill. Perhaps an Anderson. Thanks, Madam Chair. You, you knew I would anyway. Um, no, I, I've always called this a win-win, where you can get a higher octane blend in your gasoline, and where I live is about a fifteen cent a gallon um, discount to regular gasoline. So you're you're getting a better product at a cheaper price, and to me, you, you can't go wrong doing that. And um, Talked to somebody a couple of weeks back that just moved back to Minnesota. They had lived here back in the 90s, as, as uh, Mr. Severson had mentioned. And he was asking if we still had the uh, check stations where people had to bring their cars for pollution checks. I said, no, that, that kind of went away when we started blending ethanol in our gasoline. So, you know, it's made a big difference in, in uh, the air quality here. You know, we don't have impairments with our air quality like they do in California, for example. I think ethanol is, is a big part of that. So I support the bill. And, um, you know, I think the Senate's going to go with $6 million a year. And um, I would support that as well. So thank you, Representative Fredericks. And uh, I support your bill. All right. Any further discussion? 
Closing remarks, Representative Frederick. Uh, thank you, Rep. Madam Chair. <clears throat> I, I would just say that uh, it's pretty easy when you start talking about this type of a, a bill that the conversation of electric vehicles comes into play. And whether you like them or hate them, uh, that is the trend, uh, both as a state and nation, that we are going. And I would say that this bill is a yes, I'm acknowledging that, but and kind of situation. So we can do something now uh, that will have a, a, a positive environmental impact while we may continue to go on the path towards electric vehicles. And if that becomes the future, cool. Uh, but this is something that we can do now uh, that can not only benefit uh, our agricultural community, but can uh, uh, benefit all Minnesotans. So I appreciate the committee support. All right, House file 1474 is laid over. Next uh, bill we have is House file 1477, Representative Tapke on advanced biofuel, renewable chemical and biomass thermal production incentive provisions. Uh, please move your bill, Representative Tapke. Thank you very much, Chair Bang. Uh, I move that uh, House 1477 be uh, laid over for possible inclusion in a future autonomous bill. To your bill. Thank you. Uh, so 1477 is a uh, bioincentives program bill, and uh, with that we are working on funding and making a couple changes on it. Uh, the purpose of the bioincentives program are to spur private investment in production of advanced biofuels, renewable chemicals, and biomass thermal energy. These successful programs are supported by a broad bipartisan co coalition of partners, including Bioeconomy Coalition of Minnesota, and have statewide impact. And, uh, claims for incentive payments greatly exceed the funds that have been appropriated uh, for payments in fiscal year 22. Claims were over seven and a half million for the uh, program and exceeded exceeding the four and a half million that was appropriated uh, by over three million dollars. So this is asking for additional appropriations and uh, future. And I have some uh, testifiers, Madam Chair. All right, to the testifiers, we have Emily Humer, a junior at Shakopee High School. If you could proceed to the table, identify yourself before the committee and proceed. Thank you for being here today. Um, thank you, Chair. Hello, my name is Emily Hummer and I'm a current student at Shakopee High School. I'm here to voice my support for this bill. Uh, being a carbon neutral process, biofuel is a step towards a greener future in Minnesota. The current incentive process, as stated by Tabkey, uh, runs out of money annually causing companies to be less interested in investing their time and resources into using these processes. By investing more money into the biomass incentive program, uh, Minnesota would see substantial economic benefits. Uh, as the 2019 report from the University of Minnesota found that uh, every dollar invested into the biofuel incentives program generated $8.90 in tax collections and a cumulative $407.10 um, towards economic activity as a whole. Uh, companies should be incentivized to convert to biofuel, as biofuel is a carbon neutral process that utilizes organic fuels with little to no market value, such as wood and many cereal grains. Um, one of um, my personal interests is the agriculture and its sustainability. By using biofuels, products that would be typically left to decompose are given a purpose that gives people green energy and stimulates the economy. Thank you again, <coughs> Chair, for your time. Thank you, Emily, for being here. Next testifier is Rick Horton from Minnesota Forest Industries. If you can proceed to the table. Oh, Representative hey, Tapke. I just want to say really quick that Emily, uh, in addition to doing an amazing job as a uh, testifier here, she reached out uh, that she cares about the bill and is doing a project with Mr. Loisel, who's back there as well, Shockby High School teacher. Uh, and so it's just really awesome to have them here as part of the process. Thank you for being here today. Your presence is honored. Uh, Rick Horton, please identify yourself before the committee. Thank you for being here. Madam Chair, committee members, thank you for having me today. My name is Rick Horton. I'm the Executive Vice President of Minnesota Forest Industries. We're a trade organization representing the primary wood consuming mills in the state. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, several of our members uh, are participants in this program, and so we ask that you support this House File 1477. The AGRI Bioincentives Program was created to entice businesses to invest in Minnesota to utilize biomass 
to generate electricity, heat, and, and biofuels and biochemicals. Doing so would uh, reduce our alliance, reliance on fossil fuels and would create products from what is generally considered to be waste. Instead of the typical upfront subsidies to create these public benefits, this program requires upfront investment on the part of the companies in order to receive the payment, and that payment is based on actual production. However, uh, as you've heard, the program quickly became underfunded. Available funds were distributed in quarterly claims until allocated funds were expended. Therefore, uh, no, no enrollees received uh, full payment for their claims, and some fared a little worse than others due to the seasonality of their use of biomass. Uh, for example, one of my member companies, Savannah Pallets, uses biomass to heat their facilities, which you see a lot of the uh, people enrolled in it uh, do so. And um, so they're using the biomass generated at their facility to generate the heat rather than using fossil fuels to heat their buildings. However, um, because these are paid on quarterly claims, in the first quarter of the year, they haven't burnt any wood to heat their facilities because it wasn't necessary in the fall. Second quarter, they um, would, would start using heat, and they wouldn't have much of a claim, but by then, mu much of the funds have been uh, expended already. So they've got a backlog of claims that haven't been filed for the you know, third and fourth quarters of the year. So this bill would make all the program enrollees whole for past claims, you know, and, and pay them back for the investment they made in the state of Minnesota. Um, and it also provides sufficient ongoing funds to expand the program. There's, there's an awful lot of wood waste in the system. You know, we have leftover product bark and other products, sawdust at our mills, but also even in the forest, we can sustainably take more of that biomass out of the forest and it would actually be good for the forest to do so. So for those reasons, we encourage you to approve uh, House File 1477. Thank you. Thank you, Rick. Uh, next, we have this Executive Director Brian Werner from the Minnesota Biofuels Association. If you can identify yourself before the committee again. Hello again, Chair Vang, members of the House Agriculture Finance and Policy Committee. Again, I'm Brian Werner. I serve as the Executive Director of the Minnesota Biofuels Association. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity to provide testimony in support of House File 1477, and we'd like to thank Representative Tabke for his leadership on the bill, as well as all the other co-sponsors providing bipartisan support. Minnesota ethanol plants have increasingly been making the capital investments necessary to develop and produce next-generation advanced biofuels made from cellulosic biomass. Several producers have been able to bring to market advanced biofuel made from the non-edible fibrous material in each kernel of corn sometimes referred to as corn kernel fiber ethanol. Uh, the Minnesota Department of Agriculture's bioincentive program was enacted to encourage the commercial sale or the commercial scale production of these types of advanced biofuels, which have been shown to reduce the life cycle greenhouse gas emissions by over 40% as compared to baseline gasoline. But in recent years, claims have exceeded available funding and many eligible production plants have been reimbursed for only a portion of their advanced biofuel production. Uh, we support House File 1477 because it would provide sufficient funding to reimburse those facilities for their existing production gallons and put the state in a better position to spur additional investment in low carbon fuels. We've seen that the federal government through the Inflation Reduction Act has moved in a big way to incentivize the production of cleaner transportation and aviation fuels. Complementary state investment through legislation like this will ensure that Minnesota continues to harness the power of our state's agricultural, forestry, and energy resources to reduce transportation-related greenhouse gas emissions. Again, thank you for the opportunity to testify and for your continued support of the bioeconomy in Minnesota. Thank you, Brian. Next, we have is Brendan Jordan from the Great Plains Institute. If you could identify yourself before the committee and proceed. Sorry, I messed up your head. Uh, Madam Chair and members, my name is Brendan Jordan. Uh, I serve as Vice President of Transportation and Fuels at the Great Plains Institute and represent the Bioeconomy Coalition of Minnesota. Uh, I, I won't read through the membership, but there's a handout in your packet listing the kind of diverse, broad-based broad membership in the coalition, which includes a whole variety of different or, uh, organizations. Um, the bioincentive 
is I think a unique approach to how we attract new technology and new, new businesses to the state of Minnesota. I think it's very common to see states try to attract companies through upfront money in terms of grants and loans. Uh, the approach taken through the bio-incentive is to say, we're not gonna give you anything upfront, but if you come to the state and you make an investment, uh, provide jobs, uh, you will receive an incentive proportionate to the, the level of production you have. So in, in some sense, we like to say it is a boondoggle-proof program. It's really not possible for the state to put up money and not get return on investment. Um, as Ms. Humer explained, uh, we have had a lot of work done. We've had two studies from the University of Minnesota. Uh, this is also in your packet. University of Minnesota uh, Center for Economic or Community Vitality has done two studies that have been pretty consistent. We did one up front where here's what we expected to get in terms of jobs. And then we did one a couple years ago once the program was in effect. And the results were actually remarkably similar. Uh, so kind of what we expected that to happen did end up happening. Um, the program is focused only on uh, supporting new technology. Uh, I think it's been noted, but conventional biofuels are not eligible for the program. The program supports advanced biofuels. So it's supported, uh, helped commercialize uh, corn kernel cellulosic ethanol from a, a waste product from ethanol production. Uh, it's also supported diversification and a production of new bio-based chemicals in our forest products industry. It's also helping with some critical challenges for the state, uh, helping to create new markets for wood waste. Uh, we're, we're going to have uh, big challenges ahead of us with uh, wood from emerald ash borer. Uh, this kind of approach can really help with that uh, in creating new markets so we don't have a waste problem to handle. I think we also have future opportunities for managing uh, organic waste as part of uh, municipal solid waste. Uh, I would like to just really thank uh, the committee again for hearing this bill. Thank you to Representative Tabke. I also want to thank uh, Representative Anderson and Representative Frederick for being co-authors on the bill. I think we've demonstrated, uh, again, broad uh, organizational support and broad bipartisan support and urge the support of the committee. Thank you. Thank you, Brandon. Next, we have Stacy Cook, president of CODA Energy. If you can identify yourself before the committee, thank you. Thank you, Chair Vang, members of the committee, and thank you, Mr. Representative Tabke, for bringing this bill to committee. Um, I, as you stated, I'm uh, president of Dakota Energy. We run a biomass combined heat and power facility down in Shakopee, Minnesota, in Representative Tabke's di district. Um, I'm also Vice President of Sustainability for our parent company, RAR Corporation. They're a family-owned uh, food and beverage biz ingredients business, been operating in the Midwest for over 175 years. So our story, um, the program was created fiscal year 17, funded with a million and a half dollars initially. Uh, we heard of the program. RAR was building a large uh, malt kiln on their campus in for an expansion project. It takes a lot of heat. Uh, they originally built that to burn natural gas. Um, we were supplying their other kilns with uh, biomass-based heat on the campus, but we were at capacity. So we heard of the bioincentive program. They were constructing their malt house. Uh, we started looking at what we could um, modify in our facility to be able to capture that load and provide renewable biomass heat rather than fossil gas for that heat source. So in 20 fiscal 17, fiscal 18, they built their malt house. We started up on natural gas. We started modifying our facility, making the investments, uh, doing the training of the employees, figuring out how we're gonna meet that load with biomass. So we did that. Fiscal 18, we converted over from natural gas to biomass heat in that kiln. And we tried to put together a claim. We didn't have very many BTU units and we didn't quite get there, so we submitted a claim in 19. So coincidentally, the program had plenty of money in 17 and 18 when it was new, and I believe a lot of other businesses were in the same state as we were. We heard about the program, uh, started investing money, uh, making changes in our facility so we could meet a new load. We met the purpose of the program, and then the first year that there are substantial claims coming from uh, participants, there's not enough money. It was just slightly short in fiscal 19. Uh, 
$1.53 million of the claims um, against $1.5 million of the funding. So <clears throat> it was close to right size. But see, that was just at the very beginning. I, I think uh, in fiscal 20, only 50% of the pay claims were paid. Fiscal 21, ran out of money at 40%. Fiscal 23, there was additional funding applied to the program, but it still ran out at 56% of the claims paid. Fiscal 23 so far, there's more money in it this year as well, but we have $2.9 million of the claims paid in the first quarter on $5.75 million for the entire year. So it's going to likely run out of money in the second quarter. So I don't think there's, I think it's a very good program and it's done exactly what the state intended to do. Uh, companies come in, they make the investment, they employ people, they convert things from uh, fossil resources over to renewable uh, generation sources. And it's a great thing. I think the only oversight on this was that in the beginning with the funding of 1.5 million, who knew how many companies want to come to the state and expand and start converting over to renewable resources? So I think that's all there is. 1477 is simply just right-sizing the program to the demand so we can continue doing this work. Thank you very much, Chair Vang, committee, and Representative Ta Tapke. Thank you, Stacy Cook. At the moment, at the end there. <laughs> Thank just you. <laughs> you did great, Stacey. All right, discussion to the bill. Representative Anderson. Thank you, Madam Chair. Representative Tabkey, I like the bill. The one thing to clarify, it appears that you took out the requirement for local sourcing of ingredients or inputs. Um, how come? Representative uh, Tabkey? Could you, I can't hear you very well up here, I'm, I'm sorry. sorry. Madam Chair, it looks like in the bill, your, your new bill, you took out the requirement for local sourcing of inputs. Um, how come? Representative Tapke? Um, there it's, they're still in there. So if you look on line 3.3 .3, facility eligible uh, for payment under this section must source from Minnesota, at least 80% of the biomass used to produce a renewable chemical, except that. So facility side to 50. So that kind of thing. So there's still local, uh, sourcing requirements in there. Representative Anderson. I didn't hear the line number 3.3. Was it always at uh, 80 percent, Representative? Representative Tapke? Uh, at least 80 percent used uh, to produce a renew Yes, 80 percent of the biomass used. Representative Anderson. So is that a ch okay? Okay, fine. Thank you. All right. Representative Chow. This question might be for one of your testifiers or expert on this, but um, according to the uh, uh, production of uh, bio crops in Minnesota. Uh, what is the percentage of these crops, like soybeans and corn, being, I guess, consumed by this new, I guess, bio industry? Do we? Representative Tapke? Uh, Chair Vang and uh, Representative Cha. So, under uh, this, under 1470, so the biofuels, um, under this program, it is not uh, soybeans, it's not corn that's used for ethanol. This is byproducts of other things. So, this is uh, advanced biofuels. And so, just uh, the biodiesel and the ethanol as it's uh, uh, created is not uh, included in this program. And if there's, am I okay on all that? Okay. Just making sure I was saying it correctly. Representative Cha? No further questions, thank you. All right. See no further discussion to the bill. Uh, closing remarks, Representative Tapke. Thank you very much, Chair Vang. Um, this is, uh, I, I'm really excited about this bill, so thank you very much uh, for all the bipartisan support and all the folks, and uh, especially my folks from Shakopee coming today to uh, testify on it. So thank you for being here. All right, House File 1477 is laid over. All right, so that is all that we have for today's committee. Uh, our next meeting is Tuesday, February 21st, 2023, um, and this meeting is adjourned.